relationship between atrial fibrillation and strokes. And before I start, I wanted to thank you because someone nominated me for the uh, BBC One Show NHS Patient Awards. Uh, uh, and um, uh, so I heard from the BBC One Show. We'll find out a little bit more at the end of the month, but I wanted to just say thank you so much. I am so, so, so incredibly grateful. Thank you. Now, this this subject about atrial fibrillation and strokes is really, really interesting. And I just wanted to share some new insights that I've managed to glean from the latest research coming out. Okay, the first thing to say is that traditionally what people started noticing is that in patients who had atrial fibrillation, there appeared to be a higher incidence of stroke. Okay, so we... Uh, uh, what doctors started uh, finding was that they start they hypothesized that in atrial fibrillation, what happens is the atria don't contract effectively because they're not contracting effectively. Maybe there's stagnation of blood in the atria that forms a clot, and that clot can then get dislodged and go to the brain and cause a stroke. That was the traditional thinking, and this is where this. Um, uh, message has come out which is that if you have atrial fibrillation and you have comorbidities or you're older you have a five-fold higher risk of having strokes so this is well proven there is no argument about that what people then started finding was that actually if you took patients with atrial fibrillation who were younger under the age of 65 who did not have diabetes or high blood pressure or vascular disease or heart failure and you followed them up they didn't seem to have a higher risk of stroke. It was only in those people who were older and who had comorbidities that there was a higher incidence of stroke. So then that brought about the idea that maybe it couldn't, it couldn't just be about being in atrial fibrillation that increased the risk of stroke, because if you were young and you didn't have any comorbidities and you had atrial fibrillation, you didn't have a higher incidence of stroke. But if you were older and if you had comorbidities, then you did have a higher incidence of stroke. So it couldn't just be about the atrial fibrillation. Then there was some really interesting research which um, looked at people who had pacemakers or defibrillators. And the advantage with these devices is that they're very good monitoring devices. So you could uh, use a device like this to try and follow a bunch of patients up, see if they get atrial fibrillation, and then see if there was a relationship between when they got the atrial fibrillation and if they had a stroke, whether there was a temporal relationship between the atrial fibrillation and the stroke. Uh, and the very interesting thing was that when uh, you saw, when you the research, has come, the research that was done showed that actually, yes, people... Uh, who were older, who were diabetic, who had high blood pressure, did have a higher incidence of atrial fibrillation, and they also had a higher incidence of stroke, but there didn't seem to be any good relationship between the times that the patient went into atrial fibrillation and when they had their stroke. So that brought into question uh, the theory that atrial fibrillation causes strokes. It can't possibly be causing strokes if atrial fibrillation in the absence of comorbidities doesn't cause strokes and atrial fibrillation in the presence of comorbidities seems to be associated with strokes and there is no real temporal relationship between when you have atrial fibrillation and when you have the stroke. So increasingly we've started thinking that maybe atrial fibrillation is a marker rather than a cause of stroke. I've done a video on this before. Now the question is, so what exactly is it? Why is this happening? And the other thing which is really interesting is that in these studies where they had the devices, we found that actually, uh, well, the, the researchers found that actually in many patients, the first time they were found to ever have atrial fibrillation was after the stroke. And it is not uncommon these days for us to see patients who come in with a stroke and then are found to have atrial fibrillation. So... The, there, there are lots of questions here. One, what is it? What is the relationship between atrial fibrillation and stroke? Yes, we think it's a marker, but it doesn't seem to be directly causing the atrial fibrillation. That's important. The second thing is, how do we identify those people who are more likely to have a stroke if we don't see any atrial fibrillation, if the atrial fibrillation is going to come after the stroke? So this all becomes very interesting. Uh, and I think what is what research is beginning to show now and what is really interesting is that we have always thought 
we've always thought that if you're in atrial fibrillation, your atria are not working, and therefore there can be stagnation of blood in the atria forming the blood clot. But if you're not in atrial fibrillation, your atria are working, and therefore there's no stagnation. And so we've always thought, oh, it's a binary thing. You know, if you're in, uh, if you're in sinus rhythm, your atria are working. If you're in atrial fibrillation, your atria are not working. I think what is becoming to what is emerging now is that maybe there's a continuum. You know, just because you're not in atrial fibrillation does not mean you can assume your atria are working fine. Maybe there is a spectrum. The atria are working fine, then they get worse, they get worse, and there may be a bunch of people in whom the atria are not really mechanically doing very much, but they have not electrically started fibrillating yet. So they're still in sinus rhythm, they're still uh, are in a normal rhythm on the ECG, but mechanically, if you study the atria, maybe the atria are not doing very much. And maybe that's where the stagnation happens. Maybe what, that's where the blood starts stagnating and the blood clot forms. And maybe the atrial fibrillation is just a electrical endpoint, which is a terminal electrical event. So, okay, so on the electrical, uh, on the ECG, now it confirms that the person's gone into atrial fibrillation. But maybe the consequences of the atria not working precede the development of atrial fibrillation on the ECG. And this is a very interesting hypothesis because if you look at um, some people, if you look at young people, for example, who have atrial fibrillation, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, they, come and they, they go in and out of atrial fibrillation. They hate being in atrial fibrillation. They tolerate atrial fibrillation extremely poorly. You know, they'll say, oh, I feel awful when I go into atrial fibrillation. But then there's another group of patients, the older person who has diabetes, who has high blood pressure, who doesn't even know when they've gone into atrial fibrillation. And they're incidentally found at a flu, you know, flu jab when their GP is giving them a flu jab to be in atrial fibrillation. They don't even know about it. And this is, again, another, this possibly also leads credence to this theory that I'm proposing, that actually maybe in these people, the older people, the atria were actually not very effective anyway. And therefore, when they eventually went into atrial fibrillation, they didn't know this because the atria hadn't been doing very much for such a long time anyway. Whereas in the younger patient, it's quite possible that it, the likelihood is that the atria are very effective. Um, they contribute to the filling of the functioning, the overall functioning of the heart. And therefore, when these people go into atrial fibrillation, they tolerate it so poorly. So if that is indeed the case, then what may eventually start happening is that if we could identify those people whose atria are beginning to mechanically fail, then we could potentially identify stroke risk before the development of atrial fibrillation, which means that you could anticoagulate these people at an earlier stage and not wait until the atrial fibrillation. It is not uncommon when um, we get patients admitted to our hospital with stroke that that is the time they're found to have atrial fibrillation. And everyone says, oh my God, you know, the, the, the atrial fibrillation has caused the stroke. But it is quite possible that these people had this weak atria, which was still in sinus rhythm. They then form a clot because the atria, the blood, because the atria are not very effective. There's stagnation, they form a clot. The clot gets dislodged, goes to the brain. When it goes to the brain, you get a sudden surge of hormones, sympathetic hormones. That's why when people come in with strokes, their blood pressure is so high. All this adrenaline, etc., is released. And maybe that adrenaline then just pushes the person into atrial fibrillation. And that's why we see atrial fibrillation at the time of stroke. That is perhaps the more likely mechanism. Um, is there, I guess the next question then is that, is there any evidence to suggest that if you have weak atria, which are still in sinus rhythm, you have a higher risk of stroke. And the problem is that technology is not good enough at this point in time for us to routinely measure atrial function uh, mechanically. But uh, there is no doubt that if you have bigger atria, the bigger the atria, the less likely they are to be uh, uh, well functioning. So there are some studies which have looked at patients who have never had atrial fibrillation, but have big atria, and when you look at those people, and particularly those people who are older, who have diabetes, high blood pressure, and big atria, they seem to have a much higher risk of stroke, even though you have never identified atrial fibrillation in those people. So that's really interesting. And I guess um, 
there may well be a time when people who have diabetes, high blood pressure, etc., uh, are anticoagulated on the basis of atrial function rather than the presence or absence of atrial fibrillation. Uh, so I hope uh, I hope you found this interesting. Um, I think it's hugely interesting, um, and uh, I'd love to hear what you think of this. Um, uh, you know, if you have any comments, etc. But I think this is where research is going to go in the atrial fibrillation world. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please come and uh, join my Facebook page, uh, which is Your Cardiology One. Uh, if you'd like to talk to me, um, drop me a line on uh, my website, www.yourcardiology.co.uk. Um, we're doing a seminar um, on the 28th of, or 28th of April in York at the Bar Convent. Details are on my Facebook page. And also I'll be in New York uh, on the 4th and 5th of August and doing a seminar there. Uh, so if you happen to be around, uh, please drop by. Uh, all details are on my Facebook page. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for listening. All the best.